Hello everyone, my name is Kyle Hubert, and today I'll be talking to you about threat intelligence, how to focus fire on the bad guys coming through our network. Now we do have a lot of material to get through today, and we do have a demo towards the end of the presentation, so let's just go ahead and jump right into things. First, a little bit about myself. I'm an Air Force Network Analyst and Blue Team Lead, and when I'm not working with threat intelligence, I'm also interested in IoT security and purple teaming. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, I do need to say that none of this is official policy or official views of the Air Force or the DoD. Uh, these are all personal views and processes that I've made that I felt would be beneficial to share uh, with the greater cyber community. So that being said, if you'd like to uh, see more of the things that I build, by all means, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle there is aptgetcubert. And I'm always looking for feedback, so if you have uh, some thoughts on how to improve either the presentation uh, or the code that you'll see towards the end, that would be a good place to get a hold of me and make those suggestions, and I'd love to hear from you. So what to expect uh, about this presentation? Well, what you are going to learn is how to prioritize the techniques that you want to hunt for on your particular environment. You're also going to learn how to focus your defenders on specific adversaries, and perhaps adversaries that are uh, targeting your specific organization, or maybe something a little more broad like organizations in your industry vertical. What you're not going to learn is that this is some magic bullet that will always find the bad guy that will always solve all your problems. You're also not going to learn about any techniques that you don't have to look for. Uh, in a perfect world, you would be able to look for every threat actor that's out there and every technique that they use. Uh, unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. And last time I checked, I believe MITRE had identified about 106 different threat actors across the board. That's a lot of bad guys. And telling your defense team to just go find evil is a pretty broad ask when they have to look for 106 different threat actors, all with varying amounts of different techniques of accomplishing their objectives. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a little better idea of how you can focus your defenders on specific threats and prioritize so you're not just giving them a very broad go find evil. So what is threat intelligence? Well, my working definition is the application and analysis of threat information in order to better inform defenders how adversaries will accomplish their goals. Now, of course, that begs the question, what is threat information? That is defined as any information that can help an organization identify, assess, monitor, and respond to cyber threats. Uh, an example of threat information would be like an IP address. Generally, these things are more like atomic indicators, things like IPs or hash values. Um, these are things that by themselves are more like data points and don't really inform defenders of anything specific by themselves. Uh, what you want to do is you want to start adding some context around that data point. And then once you start doing that, then you start going from information to intelligence. And that's where we're kind of getting into this third bullet here. And this is probably one of the more important pieces of the presentation. So if you take away nothing else, take away this. Information becomes intelligence when it is analyzed and used to inform defenders of a specific threat. So again, going back to our IP address example, uh, what you could do is perhaps whenever you hand that IP address to your uh, network defender, you say, hey, this is a known bad IP that's used for exfiltration, and this particular adversary uses this IP address. So right there, not only did you tell them it's a bad IP, which, okay, fine, that's a good start, but you also said it's used for exfiltration, which now tells your analyst that they should be looking for data going to that IP. You also said it's associated with a specific threat actor. So now that they can do, uh, they can go and go do some research about that threat actor and see if there's any other uh, techniques that they want to uh, research or maybe hunt for on the environment. And this is where you start going from the, again, the information part to the intelligence part adding that context and connecting some of those data points together as opposed to just giving your analyst raw information. If we look at this in terms of the pyramid of pain, uh, most times when we're talking about threat intelligence, uh, we're talking about the lower three tiers of the pyramid of pain. Uh, now, to be clear, I'm not saying that threat information is not useful or not important. It is. Uh, I'm just trying to show that there is a very clear line uh, between what is threat information and what is threat intelligence. Uh, threat information individually doesn't inform defenders of anything specific. Uh, once you start adding that context and enriching that data and uh, starting to connect that information together, then you start getting into uh, the threat intelligence spaces. Then you start uh, being able to inform your defenders of something specific. 
Uh, again, going back to our, P our, our IP address example, uh, maybe you are saying that this IP address uh, used for exfiltration is, is part of this particular uh, tool set, and then they can look that up. Uh, or at the very least, they have this uh, technique that they can start doing some research on and see what's going on there. So this is where uh, it really starts to come together and crossing that line from information to intelligence. But now that you know uh, what threat intelligence is, why would you want to use something like this? I'm glad you asked. So the why to use th threat intelligence, uh, this is where you start getting those uh, stereotypical Sun Tzu quotes that come to mind, uh, but they really do make sense in this uh, context. And really the why to using threat intelligence boils down to three main things. You have your understanding, prioritization, and efficiency. Now, what I, what I mean by understanding is that by using threat intelligence, you'll gain a deeper understanding of adversary tactics and techniques uh, that are targeting your organization or organizations like your own. Uh, this is important because if you have a better understanding of how an adversary would accomplish their goals or how they would carry out uh, an attack on your organization, you have a much better chance of catching it and seeing uh, how you could mitigate some of those actions. This also gets into prioritization because if you know what to look for, you're going to probably move that up to the top of the list of what you want to hunt for and what you want your team to be looking into. So this is uh, making some of these techniques and the threat groups that execute them uh, some of your most likely uh, threats to the target, which in this case, unfortunately, the target is you. They are coming for your organization and your data, and you're trying to defend against it. Again, going back to what I said before, you don't want to tell your teams to just go find evil. So by using this prioritization, uh, you can focus them on particular groups and techniques that are most likely going to be used against your organization. And then finally, efficiency. So let's say you have identified five uh, groups that are most likely going to come after your organization uh, based on prior targets or uh, network infrastructure, whatever you deem uh, or how you decide that. One, uh, there might be some common techniques between them, such as PowerShell. So what you could do, based on whatever tools that you have available to, you, uh, to your hunt team, is you could figure out how to write a hunt that would look for PowerShell use across all five of those threat actors, as opposed to doing five individual hunts, one for each threat actor. And this is extremely important, especially when we get into, uh, if you have a smaller team or maybe a compressed timeline for some reason, being able to increase your efficiency and uh, figure out how you can do less hunts to still cover the same amount of techniques uh, or the same amount of threat actors really, really helps uh, in terms of getting through uh, more hunts and trying to find more bad guys uh, quickly. So now we're going to look at threat intelligence as a process. And this is a bit of a misconception because a lot of times when people think of threat intelligence, they think it, uh, it's more like a checklist. And they might do this before the beginning of an operation uh, or the beginning of the work week. And then they'll just go through the checklist and say, okay, they'll check the boxes. And uh, they'll say, yeah, we did our threat intelligence and we're good to go and they'll never touch it again. That's not how this is supposed to work. Uh, this is more of a process. It's something that you should be doing uh, over and over and over again. And uh, there's a lot of different processes out there to kind of show this, but the one that I like the best is the F3 EAD model. Uh, and this is a little bit of a, a weird model, not many people use it, um, but the F3 EAD basically stands for uh, Find, Fix, Finish, Exploit, Analyze, and Disseminate. And the reason I like this model so much is because it does a very good job of showing how incident response, or the operation side uh, of security uh, operations, can very easily feed into and support threat intelligence or the intelligence side of operations and how that process can begin again with intelligence feeding operations. Uh, so whenever you start this process, you're most likely going to be in the find phase. And what the find phase is, is you, you basically are taking uh, known bad, so maybe uh, white papers that you come across online, perhaps some intelligence that's been shared between you and a partner organization or a threat intelligence group that you're a part of, and you take that intelligence and you start looking for it on your network. And perhaps uh, you find something and you find some bad guys. Well, at this point, you are now in the fix stage of the incident response uh, side of this process. And fix does not mean you are fixing the problem. Uh, that, that's a bit of a misconception. 
Uh, fix actually means that you are fixating on the bad guys in your network. You're scoping the intrusion. This is where you want to identify all of the locations where the bad guys have kind of set up persistence. You want to identify all of the malware that they've dropped on your network. Uh, you want to figure out how they're getting in and out of your network. And this is where you fully scope the intrusion so that when you do take those IR actions, you're not leaving anything behind that the adversary could take advantage of. So of course, that brings us to the finish phase, and the finish, as the name implies, is where you are finishing off the enemy. Uh, you are taking those IR actions to remove any sort of footholds that they have in the network, and hopefully you're collecting some of those malware samples and PCAP files and anything else uh, that could be useful for when you get into your threat intelligence phase. So at this point, we cross over into threat intelligence and the exploit phase. And the exploit phase is where you start collecting all that information. So you take those malware samples you found, you take those PCAP files you've captured, uh, and you just want to collect as much information as possible. Now, again, at this stage, this is threat information. This is just raw data. So you just want to collect as much data as possible at this point, so you can then take that in the analyze phase and turn it into intelligence. So we're now in the analyze phase. And this is where you're going to take, as I said, that threat information and start analyzing it, enriching it, uh, adding some context to those data points. And hopefully at the end of this phase, you should have a pretty good amount of some threat intelligence that you can use. Now, this is also the stage where you would probably want to start making the attack timeline. You'd want to start looking at how did the adversary gain initial access? How did they gain persistence? Uh, what other actions did they take and when did they take them? Uh, and this is when you want to start building that out as well. Uh, so you have a better idea of how they uh, progress through your network up until the point where you took those IR actions to remove them. And then finally we have the disseminate phase. Uh, and this phase is pretty important because this is where you share those findings, those awesome white papers you've written, all that threat intelligence that you've created. Uh, and at the very least, I would hope that you would share it with your own organization. Uh, if not, maybe your threat intelligence sharing group or even the cybersecurity community at large. This is where you publish those findings, uh, you share that with the community, and then hopefully someone can take that threat intelligence and then go into their own find phase as the process begins again. Now, before we go too much farther, I do want to talk a little bit about the MITRE attack matrix, uh, because I am going to be referencing this a good bit throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, if you're not familiar, the MITRE attack matrix, uh, the attack piece stands for Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. Uh, and basically this is something that MITRE's built out that uh, they try to show every possible way that an adversary could accomplish objectives or uh, accomplish their tactics on your organization's environment. And this page in particular we're looking at uh, is a screenshot of one of the group pages that they have. Um, the, above the associated group descriptions, you would have the group name. In this case, it is APT19, uh, along with a summary of the group. Uh, you also have the associated group descriptions there, uh, or their aliases. And then below that, you have the techniques, you, uh, the techniques used. So this is all the techniques uh, that this particular group has used in the past. Uh, if it's been a while since you've looked at the MITRE attack matrix, you might notice a few things that look differently, uh, namely the technique IDs there. Uh, recently, MITRE has switched from uh, a T and then a four number uh, numbering scheme to the T, the four numbers, and then in some cases, if there are sub techniques to that category, that's where that decimal number will come into play. So that's where you'll see the decimal 001, uh, 002, 003, things of that nature. Uh, and this actually caused a little bit of issues with the demo code, uh, but we were able to uh, get that corrected for you guys so you could actually see the demo today. Um, but if it's been a while, things might look a little bit different on the MITRE attack matrix than what you past remember. So what do you need to do threat intelligence? So this uh, is, is four big points that you want to uh, make sure you have in order to do this correctly. Uh, the first one is a list of your organization's critical assets. Now this is not just your uh, secret source code or your super cool app that you build or maybe the secret recipe to the company barbecue sauce. Those are all important and should be defended. but you want to look at other things that an adversary might want to uh, leverage. For example, uh, a trusted relationship. Maybe your organization has a secure pathway or a trusted relationship with a government entity uh, or another organization. You want to take a look and see if uh, an adversary might want to exploit that 
uh, trusted relationship to go from your organization to the other organization, whatever that looks like. Uh, it's, they may not be interested in attacking you just for uh, the secret sauce that you have. Uh, they might just be wanting to uh, go through your network to hit another organization. It's just something to keep in mind. So the second point there is knowledge of threat intelligence resources. Now, the good news here is there's a lot of really good resources out there that are totally free. So you don't need to go out and spend a lot of money to start uh, a threat intelligence program or a threat intelligence cell in your organization. Now that being said, if you take a look at the products out there and think that they would be beneficial and you have the budget to do so, then by all means, go spend money on a threat intelligence uh, platform. But this is simply saying that you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Now, uh, there are some uh, resources out there that we'll go over, and there is a list of those resources uh, towards the end of this presentation that you'll see. Um, but a lot of the white papers out there, the uh, APT-specific reporting, there's some very solid reports out there that are completely free to the public. So again, uh, just be aware of what's out there and know what resources you can pull from. The third bullet here is a little bit more difficult. Uh, this is where you have to sit down and have some very honest and potentially difficult conversations to identify what your limits are. And there can be any uh, number of limitations uh, that might be on you and your team. It could be budget constraints, it could be manning, it could be time, it could be experience, and all those things are totally fine, uh, especially in the experience phase. Uh, we all start somewhere, so if you don't have a super experienced team, that's totally okay. Just, you need to make sure, though, that you understand what those limits are. Uh, if you have a list of 10 threat actors, but based on, for whatever reason, you can only look at five, you need to understand that, and you need to make sure that you're focusing on maybe those top five threat actors, as opposed to trying to spread yourself or your team too thin by trying to look at all 10. Um, so just make sure you have a pretty good handle on what you can and can't do, what is in the realm of the possible for you. And then finally, uh, you want to have a good situational awareness of world events. Now this one's a little unpopular uh, because, again, as tech folks, we like being in the bits and bytes and, and getting into the weeds of the technical side of things, and I totally get that. Uh, but there is something to be said about keeping an eye on the uh, just what's going on in the world in general. Uh, mostly because, there, uh, again, you have nation states out there that uh, some of these groups are suspected to be connected to, uh, and some of those countries' strategic intentions match up seemingly very closely with some of the actions these groups take. So knowing what, uh, what's going on in the world and how that might affect your organization can be very helpful in identifying uh, the types of threat actors that might be coming after your organization or what their strategic intentions are and what their goals might be in terms of what they might be trying to gain by attacking your organization or organizations in your uh, industry. So just to make sure we're on the same page here, because I know that I've thrown out tactic and technique a lot, uh, I just want to make sure we, uh, we're, we're on the same page in terms of the terminology. So whenever I say tactic, uh, I'm talking about the overarching goal or the objective that uh, the bad guy is trying to accomplish. So for example, a bad guy might try to establish initial access and then gain persistence in a particular environment. Those are tactics. Those are uh, big goals that they're trying to achieve. The way that they accomplish those tactics is through techniques. So in order to achieve the tactic of initial access, a bad guy might use the technique of a spear phishing link or utilizing that trusted relationship that we talked about earlier. And then once they've accomplished that tactic, they will try to accomplish the tactic of persistence, perhaps by using uh, a bootkit as the technique. So I just want to make sure we're clear on what that actually looks like and what that means uh, before we go too much farther. All right, so you have all the background information at this point. Uh, you know the, the what, the why. So how do you actually use threat intelligence? Well, first, uh, whenever you start off with this, you're going to be in the red section of that circle. You're going to be looking at all the bad guys that have ever been identified that are out there. And again, that's a lot. We're looking at about 106. So the first step is who wants your assets? Who wants to get your stuff? Who wants those crown jewels? And hopefully, uh, that should take your list down pretty considerably, depending on what your organization in, is involved in. So once you've identified who wants your stuff, uh, then you want to dig a little bit deeper into those specific groups and see if any of those groups uh, have the capability to access your assets. Now, uh, unfortunately, if we're talking about nation-state threat actors, 
then more than likely if they want your assets or they want your stuff, they can probably get to your stuff. And that's totally okay. Uh, this is just to help add another layer to, again, maybe weed out some of those uh, script kitties or less funded groups that, for whatever reason, you or your organization just doesn't feel like they're quite a threat or you just don't want to focus on them right at this point in time. And then finally, once you identify who has the capabilities to get to your stuff, then you want to see where those techniques overlap. This is getting back to what I said before when you identify that it's maybe a technique like PowerShell is used across all of the groups that are interested and can access your assets. Well, at this point, you would want to say, okay, well, let's figure out what kind of hunts we can do that can look for those, tech those shared techniques as opposed to doing individual hunts for each of the techniques. So uh, to illustrate this, let's walk through a quick scenario. Uh, for this scenario, we're going to say that you're an admin for St. Cybers Medical Center. Uh, this is a hospital that primarily focuses on patient care, but you also have some research facilities that you need to be aware of uh, and make sure that you can protect. Whenever we start this process, you're going to be in the red. Uh, you are looking at all the bad guys that are out there, uh, and you haven't whittled down that list yet. So let's start doing that. First thing you want to do is start looking at who's targeted healthcare or medical R&D in the past. Now there's a lot of good resources out there that uh, can help you with this, but the two that I'm going to highlight here are the M-Trends Yearly Report. Uh, this is a report put out every year by the FireEye Corporation. Uh, and this is a, uh, about the, the 2020 report was about 60 pages. Uh, and this will talk about large overarching trends in cybersecurity that uh, FireEye is expecting to see in the coming year. Uh, one of the findings of that report actually showed that uh, talking about ransomware use was going to go up in 2020, and I think we've all seen that. Um, so that's something you can use to get a, a more of a big picture view of things. Uh, and then you can also look at the MITRE attack matrix groups. Uh, as I said before, there's a summary on those groups, so you can actually go back and read through those summaries to see uh, if any of those groups have targeted healthcare in the past. Uh, many times those summaries will include past industries, uh, past countries that they've targeted. Uh, so that's a really good place to start to get a, a general idea of the uh, different threat actors that might be interested either in your specific organization or at the very least uh, your sector. So at this point you now are in the orange. You should have a short list of groups uh, and then hopefully you can now at this point start whittling that down to see if there's anyone in that group that uh, cannot access your network for whatever reason. Uh, to do this, you're going to want to start looking at the specific techniques that each uh, threat actor uses uh, and see uh, of the ones that want your stuff, who can access your stuff. To do this, you're going to have to dig into some of the APT-specific reporting. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to FireEye here. They have a really good report uh, on APT-41. Uh, APT-41, this report is about a 68-page deep dive, uh, and the reason I really like this particular report is that it links the activity of APT-41 back to China's strategic intentions. Uh, namely, it references China's five-year plan. It also references the Made in China 2025 initiative, uh, which is talking about how China wants to produce more higher value products like pharmaceuticals and getting more involved in pharmaceutical R&D, which is something that you need to be worried about being an admin for St. Cyprus Medical Center. So this is where, again, you want to look into uh, not only the techniques of these specific threat actors, but maybe some of their goals and some of the driving factors behind their operations. Going back to that situational awareness of world events and, and why that would be important here. So at this point, uh, you have now gotten all the way down to the blue. Uh, you've most, more than likely most of the folks that want your stuff can access your stuff, but again, that's okay. Um, and now you can start working on getting into the green. Now, uh, just to show you uh, what those threat actors look like from that scenario, uh, again, we started with 106 different threat actors, and we were able to get that down to uh, eight, really nine threat actors. Uh, Whitefly is a new addition that was just added to uh, the MITRE groups fairly recently. Um, but if you were looking at all the threat actors that are targeting uh, healthcare, you would have APT18, uh, APT19, APT41, Deep Panda, Fin4, MenuPass, Orange Worm, Tropic Trooper, and of course Whitefly. Uh, now we did add 
APT-19 on there manually. I did that uh, because if you look at the reporting for APT-19 specifically, you'll see that while they haven't targeted uh, the healthcare industry directly, they have shown an interest in R&D as well as pharmaceuticals. So that's where we added them to that list as well. And then for argument's sake, we'll say that you wrote an amazing uh, strategic intelligence brief to your CISO. You looked at the m report and did a little write-up on it. Uh, and your CISO wants you to focus on uh, suspected Chinese threat actors, as well as any actors that utilize ransomware uh, is kind of their standard operating procedure when they attack an organization. Uh, using this guidance from your CISO, you can then uh, whittle those nine threat actors down to six. Uh, you would eliminate Orange Worm, Tropic Trooper, and Whitefly from your list. So then, finally, uh, you would have a short list of six threat actors uh, from 106 that you can start looking at and now see uh, what common techniques do those six threat actors share. And this is where we're going to get into the demo because this code, hopefully, will make this process a little bit faster for you. So let's see what the demo gods have to say. All right. So you can see we got the script pulled up here, ready to go. Uh, for this Python script, you will need Python 3.8 installed. Uh, so just keep that in mind whenever you're trying to make uh, the script work. So the very first thing it's going to do uh, whenever we run the script is it's going to ask if you want to add countries in bulk or add groups in bulk by country. Excuse me. Now in this case, since we're going uh, looking at this in terms of a sector of industry. We're not really interested in adding or uh, removing uh, groups by country, so we're going to go ahead and just skip that by putting in six. All right, so now we get to the spot where we can start adding groups in bulk by industry sector. And since we are looking at the medical and healthcare industry, uh, we're going to go ahead and put in number eight. All right, so we've added all of the target or all of the groups from the medical and healthcare industry. That's awesome. So now we'll go ahead and do zero, so we don't keep adding groups um, in bulk. And then this last step here uh, is where you can individually add a group. So since again we said we wanted to add uh, APT19 because they showed an interest in R&D, uh, we're going to go ahead and put in APT19. All right, so that was added, and then we'll type in end. And now you can see this is our uh, almost final list of the nine threat actors that we had previously identified. So you can see you have 18, 41, Deep Panda, Fin4, uh, Menu Pass, Orange Worm, Tropic Trooper, Whitefly, and APT19. Now, again, we need to remove the three of those from this list before we can go any further. So we're going to go ahead and say, yes, we would like to remove groups. At this point, we would go ahead and just remove uh, Orange Worm. And Tropic Trooper and Whitefly. All right, so we've removed those three from the list. Go ahead and type in end. And as you can see, we now have our final list of six threat actors. And this is our short list that we want to start looking at and seeing what techniques do all six of these threat actors share amongst themselves. So uh, the next step here is you want to put in a minimum number of groups that share a technique. So for example, if you were to put in three, uh, then you would see all of the techniques that are shared between uh, three or more of the groups that you've selected. Uh, for th in this case, we're going to go ahead and just use four, uh, just as an example. All right. So you can see that uh, we have a total uh, number of six groups selected. Uh, and here it's kind of interesting. You can see that the total unique techniques uh, between just those six threat actors is still 90 different techniques. So that means that even if you would have whittled it down to just six threat actors and then told your uh, hunt team to just go look for every technique that those six threat actors use, you would still be looking at about 90 different hunts that they would have to go and do uh, to look for every technique that all of those threat actors use. That's still a pretty big ask, depending on the size and experience of your team. So the next couple lines here actually show the uh, techniques themselves. So you can see we have obfuscated files uh, or information, web protocols, valid accounts, spear phishing attachment, and our favorite, PowerShell. Uh, you can also see that all of these are shared between 
uh, four out of the six adversary groups that we've identified. So now uh, you have your short list of techniques that you can uh, hand off to your hunt team, but let's go a step further because telling your hunt team what techniques to hunt for uh, doesn't help a whole lot if they don't have the right data sources and if they're not ingesting the right data to actually uh, potentially find bad guys using those techniques. So this next step here will help you identify what data sources you need in order to uh, start hunting for some of these things. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do number one first. Uh, and what this is going to show you is the uh, basically it's going to list out all of the data sources that you can use to find these techniques and it's going to tell you how many uh, techniques a single data source uh, can capture. Now there's a lot of text there I understand that we'll just step through it. Uh, this is not ideal uh, unfortunately uh, in a perfect world what you'd like is maybe a couple different data sources that could potentially find all of those techniques that you've identified unfortunately in this case that's uh, not going to happen here but you can see that the process monitoring uh, can catch about uh, four out of the five uh, shared techniques. You have file monitoring can potentially catch uh, three out of those five techniques if you have a way of uh, capturing that data source. But then once we start getting down to the process command line parameters and below, uh, you can see that these data sources can only potentially catch two out of five or even one out of five uh, techniques that we've identified. And that's not as useful as you would like. Um, so let's go ahead and do number two and see if that gives us some better output. And this looks a little bit better. Um, so basically what's going on here is instead of showing uh, the data sources and the total number of techniques that they can identify, we're instead looking at it in terms of the five techniques that we've uh, shown to be the ones that are shared across all of our threat actors. So if you want to look for that obfuscated files or information, uh, you can use any one of these data sources, uh, preferably more if you can, but these are all of the data sources you could capture potentially to find obfuscated files or information. If you wanted to catch web protocols, uh, you, could ca uh, you could capture any one of those data sources to potentially uh, catch an adversary use of web protocols and so on and so forth down the list. Uh, and this just is, I wanted to add this in here uh, in case we had some of the uh, output that was a little harder to read um, and had a bunch of different data sources that maybe only could catch one, two, uh, three data sources and you just wanted to very quickly identify uh, what data sources you need for these specific techniques that you've already found. Now uh, this basically runs through a switch statement so you can go back and forth between option one and option two if you'd like. Uh, I know there's a lot of text there so if you need to take notes or uh, anything else and then whenever you're done, uh, you can go ahead and press number three, and that will exit out of the script. All right, so demo gods worked with us today. That's awesome. So at this point, uh, let's see what we accomplished uh, through that demo and through that code. Uh, so you can see that we started with 106 different threat groups. Uh, we also, from that 106, focused on our uh, six most likely attackers. And then from that group of six uh, threat actors, we still had 90 different unique techniques we would have had to look for. So uh, using the uh, TTP aggregator script there, uh, we were able to boil that down to five specific techniques we wanted to look for uh, that we can then hand off to the hunt team and also the data sources we need to capture in order for them to carry out those hunts. So at this point, you are now in the green, you've identified all the techniques, you found where they overlap, and you can uh, send your team off with uh, hopefully a, a very realistic expectation of, of what they can hunt for. So just doing a quick review here, uh, what did we really cover? Uh, first, threat information is not threat intelligence. Uh, it, it is still useful, it is still important, but information does not equal intelligence, and that's a key takeaway here. You also want to keep in mind that threat intelligence is a process. This is not something that's one and done. This is not something you just uh, do as a checklist and then say you never have to touch it again. This should be something that you're doing on a regular basis. And really in a perfect world, your incident response folks should be taking what they learn and then feeding that into your intelligence process. 
and then your intelligence folks should share what they've learned and what they've analyzed uh, and share that with your IR team. And then again, that just that feedback, that positive feedback loop really uh, helps make everybody better. And then finally, you want to be willing to consider non-technical sources. Again, I understand that as a lot of tech folks, we want to get into the, the nitty gritty of things, but we cannot discount how important some of these softer documents can be. Uh, and especially in terms of keeping an eye on what's going on in the world, uh, some of the long-term goals of certain nation states and certain groups that are suspected to be tied to those, those nation states, uh, you want to try to keep a broad uh, world view so you can see exactly what's going on in the world and how that could potentially impact your organization or uh, other organizations in your industry. I also want to take a second just to thank a few folks, uh, the Dr. Pinky and Stack Frames. Uh, these two folks did a really great job helping me out on troubleshooting some of the code uh, in the demo you just saw. As I said earlier, right before the presentation, MITRE uh, changed how they did the matrix and they changed how they outlaid some of the uh, TTPs. They also changed their backend API code a bit, uh, and that really threw a lot of things off in the demo code itself. So these two really stepped up and helped me out in troubleshooting and finding some of those bugs and fixing them uh, so we could give you guys an outstanding demo uh, without having to try to walk through a tabletop the entire time. So really big thanks to, to these two. Um, and, and helping squash some of those bugs in time. Now this is the list of resources that I've kind of been talking about throughout the presentation. Uh, the awesome threat intelligence uh, list of resources. This is uh, on GitHub and this is basically just a really big list of different threat intelligence things out there that if you don't know where else to go to start, that's a good place to go. Uh, you also have the NSI, the National Security Innovations Group, uh, they publish strategic multi-layer assessments, or SMA papers. Uh, and these are pretty beefy, they're usually above 100 pages. Uh, but these are the types of documents that can give you a pretty good idea of the strategic intentions of different nation states, and what might be driving some of their decision-making processes. Uh, so I would recommend maybe checking those out if you have some folks that like reading those sorts of things. Uh, of course we have the MTrends 2020 report, as well as the APT41 report that I talked about. Uh, the MITRE attack matrix, which I've already talked about a couple times. Uh, and then finally, we also have Intelligence Driven Network Defense uh, by Lockheed. Uh, and this is a paper put out uh, by Lockheed Martin talking about uh, the cyber kill chain, um, but it's still a good report to kind of familiarize yourself with uh, and just uh, see what they're talking about and how you might be able to tie that into your organization, uh, specifically when you're trying to write up the uh, attack cycle that an adversary uh, took in your network. And whenever you're trying to write that up for your IR report or maybe handing that off to uh, your threat intelligence folks. And then finally, we have Intelligence Driven Incident Response. Uh, now, this is an O'Reilly publishing book. Uh, last time I checked, this was about $60. Um, but this is a really good book um, that would really be the only thing you really have to pay for in this list uh, to get started in threat intelligence. Um, this book also walks through that F3 EAD cycle some more and a little more in depth. Uh, and it's a really, really good resource I would recommend picking up uh, if you want to dive into this threat intelligence and, and this process uh, a little bit deeper than what we were able to talk about today. So with that, uh, that's all that I have for you guys today. Thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. I do appreciate it. If you want to reach out uh, with any questions or comments, by all means, you can hit me up on Twitter. That's my handle again, uh, appgetcubert. Uh, you can also find all the, uh, not only the demo code, but the slides as well, uh, as well as some uh, spreadsheets that I've uh, published to work with the uh, code itself. Uh, that's all my GitLab there that you can find and just uh, use it as, as much as you want. Uh, and then finally you also have my LinkedIn there, so if you want to send me a, a request on LinkedIn or a message there, by all means uh, you can you can do that if you'd so choose. But yeah, that's that's all I have and hope you guys learned something and like I said, if you have any feedback, please let me know. Thank you.